Okay. Um, we would like to welcome those who are joining, joining, in, joining us online. We're glad to have you this morning with us. Um, announcements. Um, the one I have is Wednesday at 6.30 is prayer time. Um, is there any more announcements? Round two. Okay, since uh, it's Valentine's Day on Monday, the men's group has uh, come up with some uh, trinkets or baubles uh, and some uh, cake back there on the back table. Um, if you could uh, have the ladies go first and the ladies just grab one trinket or bauble. Um, along with cake, of course, and uh, happy Valentine's Day from the men's group and all the men in here. <laughs> okay, are there any more announcements? If not, we'll stand and sing our opening song, Love Lifted Me.
We're blessed today to have a guest speaker to come in, Susie Niwas. And uh, she is from Grove. She has a children ministry at the Grove Christian Church, and she's had that for 10 years and has done a great job, I understand. Her and her husband have a ranch out there in the area. They have two chil fine children. She went to college on a rodeo scholarship. And she played basketball. And now she coaches and officiates basketball. So welcome you, church. Give her a great welcome. Thank you. Oh. Good morning, and I just want to say it's such a pleasure and an honor to get to worship with you guys this morning. Uh, Wayne called me on Thursday morning, Friday, Thursday morning, Friday morning, something like that. Said, you want to make a trip to Kansas? And I said, I think that sounds like a fantastic idea. Um, I have had the pleasure of knowing Wayne, Shaw, and Anna for about the last fifth years almost. He was actually the lead pastor at First Christian Church in Grove whenever my husband and I got married and we were looking for a church to call home. We were raised in really different church backgrounds and so finding somewhere kind of in the middle to meet, we landed at First Christian one morning and I said, man, I love the preacher there. And, uh, and it happened to be Wayne Shaw and we kind of put roots down and um, I guess you'd say the rest is history. Uh, but this morning, before we, we dive into the message, let's take a moment and go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time and this space and this safe place that we get to worship at this morning. God, I pray that as we continue with the service, that we will have open hearts and open ears to your word. God, I pray that, that everything that we do and say in this space will bring glory and honor to your name. And most of all, I pray that the loudest voice in this room this morning will be yours and not mine. God, as we, as we continue this morning, we gather as like-minded believers to worship you. And together we join and we pray the way that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Um, so a lot of times right before I get up to speak, I pray this little prayer in my head, and it goes something like this. God, could you just show up? <laughs> like, I'm here, and I'm ready, and I'm excited, but... But you know, these are a lot of new faces, and I don't really know what's getting ready to happen. And so could you, could you just like, could you just show up? And, and you know, could you let your words be my words? And could you kind of just speak through me? And as that prayer was going through my head this morning, I, I felt God speak to me and say the same thing that he always does. He says, Susie, don't you think that I have been in Erie, Kansas for quite sometime. So this morning, why don't you show up? And that's my challenge to each and every one of you this morning. As we get ready to dive into God's Word, don't just sit back and relax. Come, come ready and come hungry and come prepared because I believe that the Lord has a message for each one of us. All right, I, I brought a picture in my slides this morning of my family. It's a little bit dated, but those are, um, those are, our children, Naaman and Natalie. Naaman is now 12 years old and, quite frankly, is almost as tall as I am. Uh, Natalie is seven, and that's my husband, Nate, the big guy down front. 
uh, that managed to get us here in just under two hours this morning. But we are cattle ranchers from a little community called Zena, Oklahoma, which quite frankly is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we, are, we are blessed to get to be raising our children in, in, a, in a lifestyle that we are passionate about. Um, and we, we get the opportunity to share the, the beef industry with, with so many of our friends and family and neighbors. And in lieu of Valentine's Day, um, I just thought I would point out, guys, that if you are still shopping for your Valentine, she most likely does not want chocolate. She would much prefer a steak. So kind of think that direction. Um. Now, Valentine's Day is not the only thing happening this weekend. I've heard a rumor that there's a football game going down in a few hours. And I mean, without the Chiefs playing in it, I know it won't be probably hardly worth watching. But um, there are fans in the nation who might go as far as to say that tonight's game is going to be a battle. A battle for a championship. And so as I was thinking about Super Bowl Sunday and the battle that's going to happen this evening, I immediately thought of one of my favorite battles that takes place in the Old Testament. And so this morning we are going to be in the book of Judges. Now, if you've spent any time in Judges, you may have found yourself saying, what on earth? is going on. You see, Judges is messy. We see people with, with all kinds of issues. We see God's people and we see that they've got problems. We see sin in action over and over and over. Same song, second verse, could get better, but it only gets worse. And, and, and from the outside looking in, we see this fallen and broken world, and it's easy to be confused by all of this unless we start looking for our own story in Judges. Have any of you guys ever lived through some messy life situations? If your answer is yes, then you know that you're not alone. You see, when you start thinking from the perspective that maybe this message in Judges isn't just something a group of people at one time and one glimpse of history struggled with, what if this is just people? What if sinners have been struggling with the same heart issues for thousands of years and the, area, the era that you're living in really has little to do with those battles? As, as we start to study the brokenness of the human heart in the book of Judges, we also start to see God take center stage. We get to see who he is, his goodness, his righteousness, his ability to work with messed up folks over and over again gets put on display. We see God's plan come together. You know, a few years ago, uh, Nate and I were out driving around at dusk, kind of putting one more check on the cow herd that was calving, and we noticed that one particular cow was struggling to deliver. And that's like the last thing you want to see as the sun is starting to set, especially where we live, because y'all have this beautiful flat land where you can like see for miles. But at our house, everything is hills and hollers. It's straight up and straight down, and there's trees everywhere. And there are no pins that are close to anything on our ranch. And so Nate and I started to put a plan together that we were going to probably need to rope this cow in the pasture. And you see, I'm the roper in the family. And so what this looks like is Nate's driving our side by side, you know, little four wheel drive, souped up golf cart looking thing. And I am standing in the bed of it, building a loop, trying to rope this cow while he's driving. And one thing I know for sure is that my horse is much easier to communicate with than Nate driving while I'm swinging the rope on the hills and the hollers, trying not to fall out of the side by side. But somehow I managed to get a loop around this cow. And then it dawned on me, what am I going to do now? <laughs> like, I, I cannot tie her to this machine that she'll flip. Um, so Nate's like, just get a rope on her and I'll catch the rope. Now, he's a big guy and he's super fast and super strong and can do things that, you know, normal size people can't pull off. So when he says things like that, I just go with it a lot of times. And so I get a, I get a loop on this cow and, and then the race is on to catch the rope that she's dragging. 
And it shouldn't have been as hard as it was, but like an hour and a half in, I'm pretty sure that we have made a huge mistake putting a rope on this cow. <sighs> Long story short, Nate manages to get the rope and he dallies it around a tree that I'm not kidding you, is this big around. I'm like, I don't even know how this is gonna work. A and he gets, gets the cow tied off and sends me for the calf. Like I've gotta go back and find this calf, or well, we get the calf pulled, the cow jumps up, she runs off, we have to catch her a second time, get, the, get her dallied off to a tree. So now we've got a baby that we've actually delivered over here, and then in like a quarter of a mile away, we've got a cow tied off to another tree. Very complicated situation, and it's pitch black. Uh, so he sends me after the baby calf to bring to mom, and I'm on the side by side, and I'm coming down off this hill, and this little slimy wet baby calf that I could barely get picked up and into the side by side, um, decides to stand up and reposition itself. And when it lays back down, do you know where it laid? On my foot that was on the gas pedal. And we're coming down this hill doing like what sounds like 65 miles an hour. And I am just trying to think like, how am I going to get this machine stopped? So I jam it into neutral and I get to the bottom of the hill and Nate goes, what are you doing? <laughs> like he cannot figure out what's going on. And I looked at him and I was like, I don't know. I really just don't have a plan. You see, when life gets messy, I like to make a plan. And if you've known me for like longer than 30 seconds, you know that my brain is pretty much always in make a plan mode. So as a girl who loves a good plan of attack, I, I love watching God's plan unfold in the story of Deborah, Judges 4. If you are the note-taking type, here is point one of three. I'm going to make this really easy for you. Number one, God's plan is perfect. As we look at Judges 4, we see that God's plan is perfect, but we are also reminded that human beings are not always obedient. Judges 4.1 says this, a little historical background. It says, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. All right, turn to the person sitting next to you. I'm a children's minister and say again. Again, yes. You know, this isn't the first time Israel has made bad decisions. We read about their screw-ups in chapter 3. Here it is in chapter 4, and in chapter 6, the uh, Israelites fall off the wagon again. What's amazing is that as the people of God continue to mess up, he doesn't turn his back on them. He keeps looking at them. This is an incredible picture of God. As we, as we study this passage, we see that God reveals himself to be the God that holds the line of morality. He sets the standard for what is just and what is right. And that means that following him requires people to turn away from their sinful nature. But we find the people saying, you know, we're not really sure that that sounds fun. Like, we want to play by our own rules, and we kind of want to do it our way, and we don't really like your plan, God. And, and the more that we think about it, we're not even really sure that we want you as our God. Now keep in mind, God has set aside the people of Israel for his own purpose. But when they rebel, by way of consequence, God gives them precisely what they've asked for. Have you ever received exactly what you were asking for, only to find yourself in a mess? In verse 2, we see that new leadership is what the Israelites want, and King Jabin is what they get. God says to them, if you don't want me as your God, let me give you just a picture of what it's like to live outside of my perfect will. When, when the Israelites get placed under King Jabin's reign, they are forced to play by his rules and his standards. Here we see a broken leader begin to oppress God's people. Now, I think it's very natural human desire to think that we have a better plan. But here we see exactly how bad things can get when we fail to recognize God's plan as the best plan. Verse 4-3 reads like this. 
Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. For he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Did you catch that? They start to get it, and it only takes them 20 years to figure it out. Friends, if you're sitting here this morning, and you've strayed from God's perfect plan for your life, Please don't wait 20 years to cry out for help. That being said, if you've been walking the wrong road for 20 years, please know that it is not too late to make a U-turn because God hears his people cry out. And the neat thing is, is that his plan is already unfolding because God's plan is perfect. And number two, God's plan is in place. In Judges 4.4, We read about Deborah. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. Here's what I love about that verse. You'll notice it does not say, then God called Deborah. It uh, it also doesn't say, well, everything was falling apart, so God went with plan B and he found Deborah. Here we find Deborah serving the Lord faithful in what she's been called to do, bringing order in the midst of chaos. We see God's plan is already in motion. He's just waiting for the people to speak up and to cry out. Is God's plan already in place for your life? Are the people and his purpose sitting in front of you and he's just waiting for you to cry out? Several years ago, I found myself living the incredibly glamorous, high-rolling, cushy lifestyle of the stay-at-home mother. You see, up until that point in my life, I had, I, had, I had had it so good. I was raised in a loving home with Christian parents. I went to college on a rodeo scholarship, exactly what I had hoped to do. Graduated from college two weeks later, I married the love of my life, got to move to a fabulous cattle ranch in northeast Oklahoma, and and a few years later, we welcomed a son, a healthy baby boy. Life was, was so easy, but you see, when Naaman was about three years old, Nate injured his back to the point that he couldn't work and was barely able to walk. And we spent an entire summer in our living room with our three-year-old, Nate laying on the couch to the floor, to the couch to the floor, watching ridiculous amounts of things like, let's make a deal, and the price is right. You know it's a problem when your three-year-old can like sing the phone numbers to the commercials. And, And during that time, Nate and I would pray, God, We know this is not your plan for us. Like, we're here and we're willing. Show us what we're supposed to be doing. Like, we know this is not excellent. We know that there's more that we have to offer, that that us hanging out in our living room for the rest of our lives is not it. Just show us. Literally, just a few months later, I would volunteer to lead a children's Christmas program at First Christian Church in Grove because honestly, my kid was three and I wanted there to be a Christmas program. That was the only reason I volunteered. Remember, my background is in ag business. I I really like my kid. I wasn't 100% sure about all those other kids at the church. And and I mean, like really, if, if If people thought I was working at a church, what would my college buddies that I used to honky-tonk with think? But about six weeks after that program, a guy named Dan Raymond, which happens to be Wayne Shaw's son-in-law, came to me and said, Susie, I'd like to offer you a part-time position in children's ministry. I really think this would be a good fit for you. (laughs) I laughed at him. I thought he was joking. I said, no, thank you, for weeks and weeks. And then one evening, Wayne and Anna Shaw showed up at my house 
sat down in my living room with a box of books about children's ministry. If y'all know Wayne, he, the man has books, you know. So he brings me all these children's ministry books, and we have dinner, and, and I was pretty sure he was going to try to talk me into doing this. I'd already kind of figured out how I was going to politely tell him no thanks. And I finally said to Wayne, I was like, Wayne, I don't know that I'm a good fit for this. I really don't know anything about kids' ministry. I mean, if I was your kid, what would you tell me to do? And he said, if you were my kid, I'd tell you to try it. Just try it. So I reluctantly went to the elder board at FCC and said, I'll make you a deal. I'll get you out of a pinch. I'll do this for six months. At the end of six months, if you're not happy or I'm not happy, no hard feelings, and we'll move on. And uh, that was about 10 years ago. Still waiting for that six-month evaluation. On, uh, on November 19th, 2017, I answered the call on my life and fully m- submitted myself to God's perfect plan as I became an ordained minister. You see, I have no doubt that there is a plan for your life, too. And if you have no clue what that plan is, there's a very strong chance that God is waiting for you to cry out. Okay, are you still tracking with me this morning? Here's the recap if you zoned out for a second. The people of God rejected God. They participated in evil, and as a result, they were sold into slavery to a foreign king where they were oppressed for 20 years. The amazing part is that when they cry out, God hears them, and Deborah, she's already in place. She's been serving as a judge to God's people, and now she reaches out to a guy named Barak because God's plan is perfect, and God's plan is in place. Deborah knows that that God has a plan and there's an opportunity for God's people to be liberated from their situation. And if you get if you read this passage of scripture, I think you get the gist that Barak knows it too. He just hasn't obeyed. Barak is hesitating. So our girl Deb, she uh, she pulls him in and she says something like, "Just a reminder, friend. Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? You see, it's not that the word of God isn't clear. Barak just hasn't obeyed. What a relief that none of us ever struggle with obedience, right? Like, like God, what is your will for my life? Chil- children's ministry? Are, are you sure about that? Or, or God, where am I supposed to work? Hmm. Maybe I need to pray about that just a little bit more. Or, or God, where do you want me to live? Wait, wait, live, live there? There's not a horse barn there. Or, God, who do you want me to marry? Marry him? I mean, I, I, I know he loves the Lord and everything, but, you know, sometimes he wears that brown belt with those black shoes, and I just, I don't know. The will of God is that you obey the word of God. Deborah knows that this, the Bible, is God's word. And, and she isn't afraid to call Barak out like, Brother, we are all just waiting on you and your obedience. How awesome is it to have a friend like Deborah, a friend who knows the word of God and has the boldness to challenge you and to tell you that you are hesitating. Friends, may I suggest that you surround yourself with these kinds of folks. You know, I have a, a friend like that where, like, you stand by her and you just want to rub up next to her in hopes that a little bit of her Jesus will rub off on you. So Deborah puts it out there. And what does our brother Barak do? Judges 4.8 says this. It says, Barak said to her, if you'll go with me, I will go. But, I will not, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. The word of God is clear, but Barak lacks courage. So he reaches out to this bold leader in his life, and Deborah, she doesn't hesitate. The really cool thing about Deborah is that she is happy to practice what she preaches. Oh, to be that type of community where we say this is what the scripture teaches, but, but let me walk with you through your struggles. I'm not going to just lead you to Christ. I want to disciple your walk. 
You know, not a group of Christians with a bunch of rules about how Christians behave, and, the, and then they're quick to scold you if you fall short. Not you're doing it wrong, figure it out, but you're doing it wrong, and I'm going to dig you out of the hole your life is in. I'm going to point you to the word. Not, I cannot believe you slept with your boyfriend and got pregnant. But can I drive you to your doctor's appointment? It's just down the road. Not, call me when you're sober. But, hey, let's go to celebrate recovery. They have a meeting every Friday. Not, wow, it looks like he's been road hard and put up wet a few too many times. But a text that says, hey, how's life going? Do you want to grab lunch? My treats. Deborah understands that the word of God is not fully obeyed until it is lived out. You know, one of, one of the interesting things that can come up as we study this passage is the question, how is it that Barak doesn't go, um, you're a woman, so shut it? I mean, keep in mind, this is a tremendously patriarchal society. And at first glance, it may seem crazy that Deborah is leading the people of Israel as a judge, and now she's basically serving as the commander-in-chief of the military. I mean, this is some serious girl power in the middle of a man's world. And, and, and this is a side note and maybe a little bit of speculation on my behalf at no additional charge, but I'm pretty sure that if Deborah was alive today, she would have rolled up to the church this morning on a Harley or maybe in a tank. Regardless, Barak understands that Deborah is a woman of God speaking the word of God to him, and so he asks her to come with him. She is so familiar with God's word that she can separate the thoughts that come from her broken human nature from the words of the living God. People who are so attentive to God's direction that they know exactly how to lead with courage, boldness, clarity, and can speak the words of truth to the people of God are worth following. Because you see, God's plan is perfect. God's plan is in place. And number three, God's plan is prosperous. Deborah and Barak, they go into battle, and in the next several verses, against all odds, but with God's favor, Deborah and Barak are triumphant. They don't just win. They make a statement. They wipe out an entire military, and they send its leaders to Sarah, running for the nearest alliance. But the joke's really on him, and this is where the story gets super interesting. You know, in children's ministry, they tell you that if you can keep the attention of the fifth grade boys in the room, you have everyone's attention. So for all the fifth grade boys in the room, this part's for you. We meet another woman. Her name is Jael, and Jael isn't the bold, brave leader that Deborah is. She's merely minding her own business, caring for her home and her family. Your average housewife. Jael invites this renegade military leader in. She gets him comfortable. She's hospitable. He snoozes off for a nap. And then check this out. We read in verse 421, but Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand. Then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. I, I have to be honest, when I first read this, I started asking myself, I wonder which one of my godly girlfriends would be able to pull that off. I mean, talk about a bold move from the Lord, for the Lord. She didn't slip on a WWJD bracelet or, or post a, a scripture on social media or, or wear a t-shirt that says, I'm with Jesus. I mean, none of those are bad things. But when God told her to take out this evil leader, this woman grabs a giant wooden nail and a hammer and drove that sucker through his skull and into the dirt. Like, boom, done. Check that off my list for today. Now hear me when I say, I am not suggesting that God is encouraging anyone in this room to commit murder. But maybe, just maybe, God is calling you to step outside of your comfort zone this morning. 
What, what I love most about this entire situation is that God uses two of the most improbable people around. He uses two women. One woman to lead an entire military operation and another one to take out its leader. And as a result, what do we see? We see the full mercy, grace, and liberation of God's people. God shows himself powerful, just, merciful, generous. This is who our God is. You see, when godly people have their focus on God's perfect plan, we see a plan that's in place, and we see a plan that leads to prosperity. We see marriages saved, families restored. We see lives changed and communities improved. Y'all, I don't think it's a secret to anyone that we're in the midst of a battle. The enemy is real and would like nothing more than for us to sit on our do-nothings and be quiet. The enemy wants you to think that you're too young or that you're too old or that you're not pretty enough or wealthy enough or you're definitely, definitely not smart enough, that you've made too many mistakes and that you're just unusable. But can I be honest with you? If, uh, if God doesn't work with a bunch of broken sinners, there aren't too many options left. So as we walk out of this place today, what qualities of Deborah are we going to embrace? First of all, she knew the word of God. She was a pro at separating her earthly desires from the truths found in God's word. Secondly, if we're going to follow God's plan like Deborah, we also need to be prepared to answer the call on our lives. You see, when Deb arose as a mother, life came back into the people. Judges 5, 7 points that out. Mama had had enough. She was ready to light a fire under those warriors, under this army that had lost their mojo. Maybe some of us here today need to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Your spouse needs you to stop complaining and start encouraging. Your children need to know that God's plan for their lives is to prosper them and not to harm them. Your coworkers, your neighbors, the people you are safely standing six feet away from at the grocery store are all ministry opportunities. Imagine with me for just a second what Erie, Kansas would look like if every day this congregation woke up and prayed, no weapon formed against my school, my office, my neighborhood, my community, my pastor, my church is going to prosper today. Not today, Satan. Church, it is time to get and keep our prayer life on point. It is time to share our faith with courage. It is time to speak God's word to the people that we are doing life with. Because God's plan for our lives is perfect. And God's plan for our lives is in place. And God's plan leads to prosperity. Thanks be to God. I'm going to close in prayer this morning, and then we're going to have an invitation song. So will you pray with me? God, as we walk out of here today, give us boldness and courage to carry out your plan. Give us wisdom to know when to speak and when to be silent, when to move and when to be still. God, we love you, and we are excited to serve you. God, I pray right now that if there is anyone in this space this morning who doesn't know you, who's on the fence, who's on the verge, who's just a little unsure, God, I pray that you'll give them the courage to speak up, to ask questions, and to have an open heart for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
And he took the bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Communion is a time to remember what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The bread and the wine are tangible, physical reminders of what Christ's love is for us. Every time we eat and drink, it is a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ. Just as we depend on food and drink to survive physically, we can only live spiritually through Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice on the cross. Amen. At the same time, communion is also a time to examine ourselves and our walk with God. It is a time to do a heart check. Are we walking out our faith and living in an active relationship with Jesus, allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives and sanctify us? Or are we living life according to our choices and only partaking in communion ritualistically? It's all about communion and fellowship with God. The dictionary describes communion as a close relationship with someone in which feelings and thoughts are exchanged. Communion is a relationship that is close and special, a relationship where you enjoy the presence of one another and give importance to spending time with them. This could be your spouse or your best friend or someone you confide in very deeply and closely. Our fellowship with God must be greater than these. Do you love God in such a manner? Do you magnify him? Do you long to be in his presence? Do you thirst to hear from him and value the time you give to God? Examine yourself and determine how much time you spend with God. Time is a precious commodity that we give to things that mean something to us. We give our time for work because it pays for our bills. We give time to our families because they're special to us. We take time to go on holidays and me time, etc. How much time do you give to fellowship with God? The answer to this question is how much you treasure Christ and love God. In Christ, is Christ your delight in the love of your life? We seek to find satisfaction in things that we want to achieve, but the truth is that you will only truly be satisfied when you're satisfied in Christ. Praise God. Sometimes we are so busy doing the things that we consider to have value for our lives. It could be at our work, our jobs that we accomplish personally. Instead, how much importance and value do you put on your relationship with Christ? You can determine it by measuring how much you love him, 
How much of Christ is on your mind and in your daily walk? How often do you spend reading his word, praying to him, and listening to him? Psalm 1611 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. As we examine ourselves, some of you may feel unworthy to come to him, thinking that you're not good enough, that you are constantly failing in your walk with God, and that you have blown it again. Again. I want to encourage you, this is the very reason Christ died, and that is why he came for you. This is the irony of the gospel. Tim Keller says it well. The irony of the gospel is that the only way to be worthy of it is to admit that you are completely unworthy of it. I encourage you to enter into the mercy of God and allow him to work in your life as you adore and love him. His Holy Spirit will transform you into his likeness day by day. Everything that you do must flow from your heart's desire for God and because of your love for him, then everything else becomes a religious activity. When you realize your unworthiness and the extent of God's sacrifice for you to rescue you and to give you hope and a future, how can you not but fall entirely in love with Jesus Christ? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the sacrifice you made for the unfailing love that you have for us, the grace of your forgiveness. Lord, we, we pray that you just be with each one here tonight, here today. Those watching online, Lord, uh, we just pray that you fill us with your spirit. Lead us and guide us in all ways and just help us to be that light uh, that others may come to find you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming today, and thank you for those that are joining us online. Uh, we will now have communion. Our communion is open to everyone. Uh, the deacons will release us row by row as we sing our last song. Thank you. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Still your love fought for me You have been so, so good to me When I felt no worse You paid it all for me You have been so, so
shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick 